Well, thank you very much for inviting me this evening to talk a little bit about Chicago's Civil War story, Camp Douglas. Before we talk about Camp Douglas, I need to do a little summary of Chicago. If you'll notice, the population of Chicago in 1860 was roughly 100,000. And in that decade, it basically tripled to th nearly 300,000. The 100,000 is interesting because the impact of Camp Douglas on Chicago, there were all, only 70,000 Union and Confederate soldiers in the Chicago area during that decade. Chicago is known for its broad shoulders. And believe me, the broad shoulders were born on the back of the Civil War. For example, the clothing industry, huge increase. Pork population increased 63, 600% in that period. And shoes and boots went from 2 million to 14 and a half million. So Chicago was a major factor in uh, the Civil War and the Civil War was also a major factor in the growth of the city. Well, we wanna talk about Camp Douglas. Camp Douglas was located on the near south side of Chicago, actually when it was built outside the city limits. The boundaries of the camp on the east was Cottage Grove Avenue, a macadam road that actually had a, uh, an omnibus on it, located very near the camp was a hotel. Uh, and during the time the prisoners were there, they built a, uh, uh, a tower you could go up for a nickel and watch the terrible Confederate prisoners in the camp. The, the northern boundary was 31st Street, which was a southern boundary of the city of Chicago at the time. Western boundary, Giles Avenue, and on the south, basically 33rd place. It's about four miles from downtown Chicago, but very much in the center of it. Today, it's a well-established area uh, in the city, and there is no, uh, nothing remaining of the camp itself. Here's a, an overlay of the camp on a modern map. Uh, that uh, overlay actually was prepared by students from the Illinois Institute of Technology who created a virtual Camp Douglas uh, using information they were able to obtain. Here you can see the Illinois Central Railroad uh, that was only 400 yards from the camp. And as the camp developed, a station for the Illinois Central was built there. This area of Lakeshore Drive was landfill. The lake actually at the time came up uh, to the Illinois Central Railroad. As a matter of fact, part of it was uh, on trestle at that point. So Lake Michigan was much closer to the, uh, the camp itself. The camp consisted of four independent areas. The camp was built there in 1861 to provide the reception center uh, and mustering in center for units of the Union Army that were entering the service from the northern third of the state of Illinois. Um, the camp consisted of Garrison Square is shown here, which is as the name implies, is where the garrison was housed. Also the headquarters was there. On the southern end was White Oak Square. White Oak Square was also where the, uh, the units, some of the units were housed. Interestingly, when prisoners first arrived, that's where they were housed. And in many cases, they were housed in the same barracks as their guards, which made for some interesting times at the camp. This area marked in this 1865 map of uh, the camp as South Square, sometimes known as Hospital Square, because there were two hospitals. This was a Confederate hospital for the prisoners, and this was a Union hospital. Also administrative uh, activities were uh, headquartered there. This area called Prisoner's Square originally was configured similar to Garrison Square. And in early 1864, uh, it was created, the 66 barracks were created to house the prisoners. From early 1864 until the end of the war, this is where 
the prisoners were housed. Interestingly, they, the camp was named for Stephen Douglas, uh, the senator whose, whose estate was just south of the camp. Although contrary to common belief, the land was not from Stephen Douglas. It was primarily from a gentleman by the name of Henry Graves. Uh, this little notch, which was kind of interesting because uh, Henry Graves' wife refused to leave. She refused to, to leave her house. So they built a camp around her. I've often said that someday I'm going to be lucky enough to, uh, uh, to meet people from the Civil War. There are two I want to meet, Abraham Lincoln and Mrs. Graves. I'd like to know how she enjoyed having roughly 70,000 soldiers in her backyard, untold number of horses with very poor sanitation. I wonder how she liked it. She lived well after the war, but I can find no information on her re reaction to it. The camp was chosen by a politician, not a military person. Had the camp been looked at by the military, it probably would not have been built there. It's built on sand with a clay base that turns into a quagmire during a uh, rainy time. The sanitation was abysmal. Uh, let's look a little bit at the history of the camp. As I said, the camp was opened in September 1861 to receive Union soldiers. Um, the uh, majority of the soldiers trained there by regiment were trained through early 1862. After that time and after the prisoners arrived, there were replacements, small units, company-sized units that were mustered in there throughout the war. But a majority of the camp uh, mustering in was done by the end of 1862. As a matter of fact, there were a number of satellite camps around Camp Douglas since the camp itself was not large enough to handle uh, the number of people. The first prisoners arrived in February 1862. Uh, these prisoners came from Fort Donelson. Um, Fort Donelson, uh, which uh, surrendered on September 16, 1862. Uh, a total of about 7,000 prisoners arrived from Camp Douglas, uh, from uh, Fort Donelson to Camp Douglas. Why was Camp Douglas selected? Well, the criteria for selecting prison camps by the uh, Union were three. One, it needed to be far enough away from the fighting that raids couldn't be held to release the prisoners. Two, it needed to be on good transportation from the field. Uh, the river system, the Ohio River, Mississippi River system, and the Illinois Central Railroad that ran from Chicago to the southern tip of Illinois and Cairo made excellent uh, communication uh, north from the field. And finally, it, they wanted the camps near a metropolitan area for logistics support. Um, well, logistics support in Chicago certainly was adequate. You know, also, as a matter of information, other cities such as Indianapolis, Indiana, Springfield, Illinois, Columbus, Ohio, in the Midwest became the centers for uh, prison camps. But the first ones arrived uh, in mid at the end of February. The camp operated until December 1865 when it was literally torn down. By December 1865, the camp was gone, nothing remaining. Most of the prisoners departed the camp in Ju by July of 1865. Um, a few remained until the camp was closed in November and December. Those were those who were very, very ill. Um, here's some of the ideas about the camp. Here's a typical photograph of the camp. You can see the barracks that they lived in. These barracks were typical of barracks at the uh, reception centers or the mustering in centers of the Union. Here's an interesting photograph, probably some of the first prisoners. Uh, this was February 1862, likely prisoners from Fort Donelson. 
The interesting thing about this photograph is one of the criticisms of, of prisons during the time was that they provided no support to the prisoners. These prisoners are wearing union overcoats. You can tell actually by the blue color and the button configuration. Now, whether this was a propaganda photograph of these five soldiers wearing nice warm uh, union coats, and it was about 20 degrees when they arrived there, or did they take the coats away from them afterward? Nobody knows for sure, but at least five had them for a while. These are Morgan's Raiders uh, who are well known to Camp Douglas. We'll talk more about them later. Uh, approximately 5,000 of Morgan's Raiders were held at Camp Douglas and were an interesting lot for the camp. Let me give you some just some plain old ordinary facts about Camp Douglas. It was approximately 60 acres in total size. It contained 200 buildings of which 66 were barracks for the prisoners. And as I mentioned, by December 1865, all 200 buildings were removed. None of those buildings, as a matter of fact, were built on foundations with the possible exception of the uh, camp uh, headquarters. And we'll talk about that later. Trained about 40,000 Union soldiers. It was one of eight Union camps that also trained African-American soldiers. It was one of the longest operating prisons in the Civil War and certainly of the Union camps. A total prisoners of about 30,000 went through Camp Douglas. 12,000, a little over 12,000 were the most held at any one time. And that figure, 12,082, is a figure that is used to compare prison camps in the North. Um, the 30,000 is an estimate because of poor record keeping. For example, if a prisoner escaped and returned, was he a new prisoner or was he a return prisoner? Records don't indicate it well. The 12,000 was from muster, mustering rolls that were called for uh, from time to time in the camps and tended to be relatively accurate. Unfortunately, Camp Douglas had the greatest number of prisoner death in Union prisons. Did not have the highest uh, uh, mortality rate. Uh, that distinction went to Elmira, New York, but the largest number died at Camp Douglas. Documented prison deaths due to disease was a little over 4,000 of 70,000 treated. You'll notice that 70,000 indicates that there were a lot more than uh, one visit. Now that 70,000 number is based on records from the prison hospital. Uh, if prisoners were ill or died in the barracks and never got to the hospital, they were not counted. So it was very difficult to tell the total number of disease deaths. Uh, the total deaths are estimated to be between five and 6,000. Uh, no one knows for sure, but we figure between five and six died. Why was there loss, such loss of life? Well, one of the reasons was there was no history of prisoner incarceration. Prior to the American Civil War, the fate of uh, captured combatants, which I refer to call them at that time, was one of two things, death or likely parole. Parole was the primary way to handle uh, captured combatants. Mobile armies prior to the Civil War did not have the time, the men, or the resources to handle prisoners. Therefore, have them sign an oath of allegiance, at, uh, I mean a parole that they will not fight until they are properly exchanged, and the problem is gone. Uh, changes in technology, including railroads and the improvement of the, ra of the water system uh, the river systems changed the way prisoners could be handled. They could be moved away and not paroled. The second is poor training of leadership, guard of the leadership and guards. Leadership at Camp Douglas was generally a, uh, in the, certainly in the early days, a commander who was mustering in his regiment. He was identified and Colonel, you are now commanding the prisoners. Uh, and by the way, we're not giving you any more information than that. The guards frequently, and particularly in the early days, 
uh, were constricted, constrict, constricted from uh, units that were mustering in. We have evidence of camp commander going to a mustering in unit saying, send me six people as guards. These guards were basically told, they're the prisoners, you're the guard, if they don't do what you're supposed to, they're supposed to shoot them. The other thing that wasn't available at the time was any training for our soldiers on how to act as prisoners. Training of Union and Confederate soldiers during the Civil War really were two things, maneuver and firing, and that was about it. And I think uh, evidence would show that lack of knowledge on how to be a prisoner had an impact on life and quality of, of life in the prisons. High leadership turnover was another problem. Uh, Northern prisons, and Camp Douglas being one, were generally commanded by senior officers, colonels or brigadier generals. However, there was high turnover. In the three and a half years Camp Douglas was in existence, there were 12 command changes with nine senior commanders and also three young captains who were there uh, when there was uh, an exchange of prisoners. So this turnover was difficult. Once the commander realized what was needed, he was gone and there was no continuity. Lack of preparation uh, for, for long-term incarceration. The concept during the Civil War was incarceration would be short term. The Dix Hill Cartel, which related to parole and exchange, indicated in, its, in the document that prisoners would be exchanged within 10 days of capture. This was not a practical solution. General Miggs, uh, who was uh, quartermaster general, was oh, had overall command of prisons. And uh, Colonel Hoffman, who was a commissar of, of prisoners, used this as an excuse frequently uh, for not improving uh, facilities. Whenever a commander would ask for money to improve facility, the response would be, well, they're not gonna be there very long. We don't wanna spend the money. There were, however, two exchanges of prisoners, uh, one in 1862, middle of 1862, one in the middle of 1863. At that time, the camp was basically empty for a number of months, but very little was done to improve conditions. In mid-1863, uh, President Lincoln suspended the exchange of prisoners based on information received that the Confederacy would not treat African American soldiers as captured soldiers, but rather as escaped slaves. As a result of that, Lincoln said, we will not exchange any prisoners. Therefore, the camps were faced with long-term incarceration, which caused a great number of problems. Another reason for loss of life was a lack of natural immunity due to the rural environment of the Confederate soldier. They were not used to being in large groups of people. Uh, childhood diseases such as measles were very much a killer and other communicable diseases uh, were rampant in the camps to a great extent as a result of a lack of any immunity. Condition of prisoners, and their diet change also had an impact. Diet from pork and potatoes to beef and bread did not treat the prisoners well. Condition of prisoners is another. Let me give you an example. Let's take the first prisoners from uh, Fort Donelson. The Battle of Fort Donelson took place between February 13th and February 16th, 1862. And you'll recall the, your history, it was in a snow and rain. The Confederate soldiers had been in, in this not very sanitary condition for a little over a month. On the 16th, about 12,000 people surrendered. General Grant said at the time, you can take anything you have except your weapon and I'll give you two days rations. You're leaving here. He put them on unheated riverboats up the Cumberland River to the Ohio River to Cairo, Illinois, and some went to St. Louis who were, who were ill at the time or wounded. 
They were placed on unheated uh, railroad cars of the Illinois Central and sent north. The first group, about 1,200 prisoners, arrived on the 20th, not two days, but four days after they left. Uh, it was about 20 degrees in Chicago at the time. Uh, so after four days transportation, they arrived in Chicago. Several days after that, a number of other totaling about 7,000 arrived. So you can imagine the condition those prisoners were in at the time. Looking at conditions generally, much of the deaths in Camp Douglas and other Civil War prisons took place within 90 days of arrival in the camps, give you an idea of condition of prisoners. Finally, inadequate or primitive medical care was a factor. And medical care is, we know about the medical care. One which is interesting is that uh, smallpox uh, had, a, had a vaccination available and was used. And looking at the diaries, particularly one diary of a Curtis, Curtis Burke, a prisoner at Camp Douglas, he was forced to have an inoculation for smallpox. And he said in his diary that he squeezed it out and rubbed it out so it wouldn't take effect because he was concerned about the, the infection would likely follow. And in his case, it was get an infection and have my arm cut off or maybe get smallpox. He chose uh, the former. Interestingly, he got smallpox, but uh, lived through it. But let's look at those diseases. And you can see in this, this busy chart, but you can see the deaths were from primarily communicable type diseases or diseases that resulted from poor sanitation. And that was typical of conditions at Camp Douglas. One that is kind of interesting is, is scurvy but only 39 died. Scurvy was prevent, present, preventable. Uh, however, General Colonel Hoffman and the commanders of Camp Douglas failed to provide the necessary fruits and vegetables that were available uh, to prevent scurvy. With only 39 deaths, however, this 3,700 who were uh, afflicted with it, I suspect a number of them died of other diseases uh, as a result of being torn down by uh, the scurvy. Those who died at Camp Douglas are now interred at Oakwood Cemetery at 67th and Cottage Grove, about four miles south of the camp. Originally, they were buried in what was called City Cemetery, which was uh, north of the downtown area. And in 1860, 7, 1868, they were removed uh, as that cemetery was being abandoned. Um, no one knows exactly how many were moved there. The mortician who buried them originally had a number. He also said he sent a number of bodies home or south. City Cemetery had a different number that they said they received. The or the person, not a mortician, who moved them to Oakwood Cemetery had another count. And Oakwood Cemetery merely said, put them over there. They didn't even count them. Um, we do know that 4,243 are specifically named on the monument that was dedicated in 1865. We do know that more Confederates are buried in Chicago than anywhere north of the Mason-Dixon line. And Oakwood Cemetery is considered to be the largest mass grave in the Western Hemisphere. What do we know about Camp Douglas and how do we know about it? We're very fortunate there are a lot of photographs uh, that remain, a lot of etchings and other drawings that are available at the camp, and a lot of actual um, maps and diagrams of the camp. The one on the lower right there is a, a prisoner square in about 1865, and it showed the exact dimensions of the buildings, their distance between each other, the distance in the streets between them, a great deal of detail which has helped us identify actions in the camp. But I like to talk about people. I find people a lot more interesting than uh, facts and figures. 
And Morgan's Raiders are one that are very interesting to, to know about. As I mentioned, they arrived in mid-1863, virtually concurrently with Lincoln suspending the ex, uh, exchange of prisoners. They realized that they could leave Camp Douglas in one of the following ways. They could die, the war could be over, they could sign the oath of allegiance, or they could escape. Well, they didn't want to die. Sure, it didn't look like the war was going to end soon. They would never sign the oath of allegiance, so escape was their one way out, and they really tried to escape. Time after time after time, these men led escape attempts and successful escapes. They also harassed the guards unmercifully and they managed to maintain their unit integrity. Uh, one, by being some of them in the same barracks, and they also had a, a, a band, presented concerts, they had a minstrel show, and they published a newspaper, uh, The Vendetta. The Vendetta was, uh, uh, was a one-page newspaper that had uh, news, much of it incorrect, political statements, much of it very Southern oriented, and even ads. Various elixirs were available, and on Block 37, you could get the best clay pipes available. So they were very, very conscious of working together and being together. I did a uh, unscientific study of their death rate based on the number we think were there of about 5,000, and the deaths uh, it indicated on the monument at, at uh, Oakwood Cemetery. I believe the death rate of these prisoners was between five and seven percent compared to 15 percent for the general population. And I attribute much of that to their unit integrity. Fast forward to 1955 when the code of conduct was provided for military and I'm going to read you a few of the components of that that related each to the members of Morgan's Raiders. You'll use all men's means to resist. It's your duty to escape. You will neither seek nor accept favors. You will never accept parole, and you will keep faith in your fellow prisoners. That's what Morgan's Raiders did. Interesting story. Some other unknown facts and unknown deed doers uh, that I'd like to talk about. First of all, many of these come from diaries and journals. Diaries are very, very good first person uh, reports. They do, however, reflect that person's opinion. Journals are also an excellent source. However, many of those are written well after the Civil War and for various reasons, ranging from justifying their actions to perhaps getting a pension. Uh, letters are also good, but interesting. Letters are written for the person that they're sent to. We have in the foundation a, two letters from a prisoner, one written to his mother and one written to a friend describing the same set of circumstances. You wouldn't know they were the same when you read the two letters. They were slightly different in telling mom or telling his buddy. Official reports are also interesting and official reports are, are used by historians to justify all kinds of activities during the Civil War. However, you have to realize commanders who wrote reports, who sent information to their uh, superiors had sometimes ulterior motives. Many times battle reports were written to justify a win or a loss. Newspaper articles are also interesting, although they do reflect both regional and uh, political biases. But let's talk about some of them. One person who was very interesting to me was Robert Anderson Bagby. He was a prisoner from 1863 to 1865. He could have left Camp Douglas anytime he wanted to by signing the Oath of Allegiance. He was captured in, in Arkansas, but was from Missouri. And if you were from a border state or a state controlled by the Union, if you signed the Oath of Allegiance, you could be sent home. 
Bagby did not. He refused to sign the oath of allegiance, and I thought it interesting what he wrote in his diary. And let me quote from February 27th, 1864. There was some recruitment in the camp about taking the oath. A good many were taking it. I disagree myself, taking the oath was a disgrace alone. Although I'm doing all right, taking the oath was more than I could stand. I felt lonesome having been left alone. I could not take the oath for I thought more of my honor than I did my case. How could I stay at home after taking the oath? How could they have confidence in a man who would take the oath? Honestly, they could not. An interesting perspective of the oath of allegiance. Bagby was a nurse in the prison hospital and tells a great deal about conditions in the hospital in his diary. Another interesting prisoner was James Blanchard. Blanchard was a trying anything he could do to escape. In March 1863, he was caught slipping by the sentries. In April, he escaped over the fence to be caught in downtown Chicago. I mentioned there was an omnibus going up uh, uh, Cottage Grove Avenue. Many of the prisoners who escaped got on the omnibus, went to downtown Chicago, generally got a snoot full of liquor, had a southern accent, probably dirty and unkept, maybe wearing Confederate uniform or partially, and wondered why they were addressed, uh, arrested when they were drunk as an escaped prisoner, but they were, and he was one. He was brought back and in May bribed his way out, but he was apprehended again. He was later caught trying to tunnel his way out. Well, thank goodness to the guards, he was then exchanged. I think they all applauded when he left uh, for the exchange. John Miller, another interesting uh, prisoner. John Miller was a saloon keeper in Chicago. Well, his saloon went broke and he failed to pay a number of his creditors. He went south, joined the Confederate army, unfortunately was captured and found his way back to Camp Douglas as a prisoner. Well, his creditors found out he was there. Well, they couldn't get any money, but they used to come to the camp just to harass John Miller about what he owed them. I never could find out what happened after the, after the war, after he was released, if, if his creditors ever got any money. But he didn't have a pleasant time as a prisoner. Young man and his mother is another, it's a nice story from Camp Douglas. Young man left in 1862, he was about 18 years old, went south, joined the army, was captured also back to Camp Douglas. His mother, who was still in Chicago, found out he was here. She went to visit him, and the story goes that here's what she said to him. Oh, my dear boy, you have been the subject of many prayers, and you are not past praying for it yet. The prison authorities released the prisoner to his mother. Nice story. On the other hand, Lieutenant Fife's dog is another story. Uh, Joel Fife was a commander of the guard. He was from the 8th Veteran Reserve Corps. He had a pet dog. He used to run around the camp. Everybody liked the dog. Kind of friendly dog, terrier. Well, it came up missing one day. Well, Lieutenant Fife wrote a little note and put it on the bulletin board in the prison compound that said a $10 reward for the return of my dog. Now, the poem that was written later on there that he found uh, was written by a prisoner, and a number of prisoners in letters, diaries, talked about this. None of them admitted they had anything to do with it, but the poem read as follows. For the want of bread, the dog is dead. For the want of meat, the dog is eat. So much for Fife's dog. Finally, I'd like to talk a little bit about John Copley. Uh, John Copley wrote a diary that just something you had to read is the most colorful writing you can imagine. 
And there were five guards who were notoriously awful. They were notoriously brutal. Several prisoners in diaries and journals talked about them. Well, Copley described a couple of them, and I'm gonna read his description of two. One was uh, his description of old Red O'Hara, who was a brutal guard who used to beat prisoners. O'Hara got his up comeuppance eventually when he was killed in a knife fight in a saloon in downtown Chicago. But here's what Copley wrote about uh, old Red O'Hara. The large ill-shaped nose and two dull gray eyes placed in the midst of a pair of unsightly cheeks gave to his countenance a most hideous and semi-comical appearance and expression. Two ponderous ears stood out in bold relief, one on each side of his head, somewhat resembling the side lamps of a carriage. Pretty good description of some, what is it not? Well, there was another one, Captain Spoonable, who was commander, one of the commanders of the guard, he was not liked at all. Fife was okay. Uh, and here's what Copley said about him. He was of medium stature, figure grotesque and ugly in the extreme, features coarse, face resembling a well-grown artichoke, covered over as it was with large bumps. Hair stood out straight up, when not kept saturated with grease or oil. Again, interesting description by Copley. You can see why you want to read his diary. I want to talk now a little bit about Camp Douglas Restoration Foundation, who we are. Uh, we were organized in two, 2010, and our objectives, one, is to create a museum on the site of the camp as an interpretive and educational facility. Two, to provide educational tools for educators and historians. Three, and important, is to provide educational support to Civil War roundtables. We feel the Civil War roundtables can be a tremendous source in improving the education on the Civil War in our schools. On our board, we're fortunate to have two retired educators uh, who are well-versed in common core and other requirements of teaching. Uh, these two are available to any Civil War roundtable to assist them in developing material that they might use in their local community. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about some of the work we've done in that regard. We also want to provide a research facilities for descendants of Camp Douglas prisoners and Union soldiers. There's a lot of information, but it's surprisingly diverse, we'd like to get it into one uh, database that we can provide uh, at no charge to as many people as possible. One of our major activities is archeological investigations. Beginning in June of 2012, we started our first excavation in a public park. We then, uh, from 2013 through 16, did excavations in a, in a local public school. And recently we've done excavations in uh, pr on private residence. Um, they've been conducted in cooperation with DePaul University, Loyola University, Marquette, Northern Michigan University. We've also had students from the University of Chicago, Northwestern and others uh, joining us. Um, we were funded by the Abraham Lincoln Bicentennial Foundation and by a company, Clark, local company, Clark Roofing. When you're doing archeological in, uh, investigation, it sure helps to have pickup trucks available to you, lumber, fencing, and so forth. Clark Roofing provided all of that. The goals were pretty simple. We wanted to confirm the location of the camp. We wanted to obtain period artifacts. We wanted to obtain other historic information on the community. Um, the community, Bronzeville, uh, is a tremendous historical value. When doing archeological investigations, you literally dig a line through the community's history, in our case, down to the Civil War. We wanted to retain and maintain that information for the community. And we wanted to increase awareness of Camp Douglas. Uh, this is a map that shows where we, the yellow shows where we actually dig. Our first one was here. 
near the camp headquarters. This is the magnet school grounds, and this is the pri private residence. The uh, pink ones are areas that we, we have done preliminary investigations and hope to do some digging. Unfortunately, the owner of a majority of the, the control of a majority of this property is not at all cooperative. Uh, they have refused to do anything with us. So those uh, circles are really in areas uh, that are controlled by the city of Chicago. Give me an idea of some of the work we've done. This is some of our first uh, work. This is Dr. Scott Demo from Northern Michigan University who managed that. Um, this gentleman here, he, some of you may know, this is Dr. Ted Karamansky, a Loyola University for history professor and uh, author on the Civil War. He spent uh, four days in 90 degree weather digging with his students. Um, what we found in that was the headquarters uh, stone of the foundation. Uh, that was probably the only building with the foundation. We we're able to locate that based on its location, where it was quarried, and the tool marks were from the Civil War. Uh, this is our schoolyard uh, where we did a number of excavations. This is Dr. Michael Gregory from DePaul University. Mike uh, had uh, headed up the rest of our uh, investigations. Mike is also a member of our board of directors. We've had over 350 volunteers doing the digging from students to just uh, interested individuals. This gentleman, for example, was a tour bus driver in Chicago who wanted to know more about the history. This happens to be one of our directors or one of our education leaders who was involved in the dig. Our excitement was to work with the third graders of the school. We did in-class in activities. We also had them out on the dig site. This is another one of our directors who is also an archeologist by uh, education. And these kids enjoyed themselves. In fact, the uh, teacher or the principal of the school said the highlight of their year was when we came there. The first military item we found, we didn't find until December, until May of 2014, and this is a cap badge, uh, about one inch high. Uh, it was issued based on its configuration uh, by the Union beginning in 1863. A little bit of an interesting story when it was found. It was at the end of the day and two of our volunteers were finishing up screening the last two buckets. I got a phone call from uh, one of them. He said, uh, I'm sending you a photograph, give me a call. And this is a photograph he sent me. I called him back and only said, ask one question. I said, tell me it isn't plastic. He said, no, it's not plastic. And so it was been determined that that was the first military find we have. We found a number of others since then. A lot of US military buttons. Um, these buttons were on tunics that were also issued to the Confederate uh, soldiers as replacement. The rubber gr gromlets from the Blank rubber blankets were typical of the blankets of both the Union and the Confederates. We found a number of 58 caliber mini balls. We're not sure why we found them, where we found them, where they were dropped by the Union guards, or they may have been held by the Confederates as uh, uh, used in art projects, which they were many times. We we're particularly happy that we found them with glass fragments. There have been questions over the course of years where the camp ended, where we were digging, a number of people said was not part of the camp and was never built on. But the glass, which came from, probably from the destruction of the buildings, indicates that there were in fact buildings built there. So it was very important to us. Other military items we found were earthenware from the period, prosser buttons, which were, um, used in the underwear of both Union and Confederates, and nails, glass, and mirror glass from the period, most likely from the camp when it was raised. Our most significant artifacts is the black eye button, which was manufactured in the Confederacy. This is the one item we have found that is confirmed to be of, of uh, Confederate origin. 
you can buy these on uh, eBay for about 250 bucks. We wouldn't take 250,000 for our buck. If you have want more information on the camp, uh, there are two sources, my book, Story of Camp Douglas, and also I uh, transcribed our Anderson Bagby's diary. Those are both available on our website. Camp Douglas book is also available where most books are found. However, if you buy it on our website, 100% of the proceeds go to the benefit of the uh, foundation. Another book of mine on general military camps is coming out in 2021. Uh, hopefully you can look for that. It talks about why the camps were in the condition they were in. If you're interested in Chicago history in the Civil War, Rally Around the Flag by Ted Karamansky, I think is the best single document. The only thing there now, since it's all been torn down, is this historic marker located in Martin Luther King Drive, just north of 33rd Street, at the edge of the uh, Prisoner Square portion of Camp Douglas. Camp Douglas, uh, we have a website, campdouglas.org. Uh, you can get a lot of information. We publish a quarterly newsletter that has information. We're also always interested in donations and support and appreciate any support you can give us. It's been an honor and a pleasure to have an opportunity to present this information. Um, I hope you enjoy it and eventually we'll have a chance uh, for me to answer some of the questions you might have that came up. Again, thank you very much.